Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who's given unto thy servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity, we beseech thee that thou wouldst keep us steadfast in this faith and evermore defend us from all adversities who livest and reignest one God, world without end. Amen. Verse 5 of him, Christmas hymn 94. Thus spake the seraph, and forthwith appeared a shining throng of angels praising God, who thus addressed their joyful song. Well, we turn our attention to a file that just appeared, thankfully, from the Reverend Dr. Torrance Kirby of McGill University. And from the sixth, I've read this before, but we're going to read it again. Uh, I want to track down some of the connections to our beloved saint here, Thomas Cranmer, who's got a back a room up on the second floor. <laughs> As I joke here, and the kids laugh at Dad who talks to dead guys. We, they think I'm a little crazy, but this is an appears in the 16th century journal in 2008, 39-2, Sin and Sedition, Peter Var Martyr Vermigli's sermon concerning the time of rebellion of the Parker Library. Um, Peter Vermigli, a minister or abbot in Naples, and also in Lucca, works his way up to Strasbourg, another place finally gets to England and lectures on Romans <laughs> and 1 Corinthians. Uh, apparently his claim to fame, as, as it were, if I could use that, it, Dr. Frank James says is he was a Bible man. And he really was a constantly expounding the scriptures. And I don't think he understood English, it was my understanding, probably worked in Latin. And at some point, his wife dies, her body's desecrated in 1553 at Oxford. Um, her body's thrown, and apparently she was corpulent, and they made fun of her. And of course, he was a lewd, lascivious abbot who got married, which there was still the, the, the that ethos going on. Even Queen Elizabeth had it. But they threw her body in a dung pile in Oxford and then after Elizabeth came to the throne, they rematriated her and buried her mixed her bones up apparently with the St. Fridesworth? Fridsworth? Anyways, um, this is Dr. Kirby's uh, work on sermon concerning the time of rebellion in the Parker Library. We'll see what he says. Again, I, we've read this before, uh, but we're, we're tracking down things, all things Vermigla E hyphen Dr. Cranmer. And it's my contention, my thesis, yet unproven, but I'm working on it, that uh, Peter Vermigla E, Thomas Cranmer was a virtual reflection of Vermigla E, the scholar, that needs to be documented, of course, and thought out more clearly. Um, in this book, I'm not sure if Dr. James brings that out adequately enough, don't know. But the thing is, the question is floating, and the we're putting the evidence together before the jury. Anyways, here we go with Dr. Kirby. An autograph sermon by Peter Vermigli e with M Matthew Parker's annotation. Sermo Petri Marti Manu Propria Scripta in Seditionum Devonisium. That's the 1549 Devonshire uprising down in the neck of the woods where my mother's line goes right back, direct line, right back to 1555, but this is six years before it, 1549. My understanding, I will see what the professor provides. My understanding is that Vermigli e was sort of a ghostwriter, so to speak. Cranmer took it over nearwise verbatim and presented that as the rebels 
we'll see, we'll see what it says, is included among the Reformation manuscripts in the Parker Library of Corpus Christi College, Cambridge. Preached at St. Paul's, although not by Vermiglii himself. The sermon constitutes a response to the popular uprising in Devon and other parts of the realm precipitated by the promulgation of the first Edwardine Act of Uniformity, 1549, with its prescription of the new vernacular liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. Vermigla E offers a measured response to the actions of both the rebels and governing authorities based upon an appeal to the principles of a Augustinian political theology. We got to, we got to, uh, and there's some meat there in Augustinian political theology, Cranmerian, um, and not just Cranmer, or, uh, all parties to the conflict, government, gentry, and commons are found to be at fault. And Vermiglii proposes penance all around as the remedy of all plagues. On July, 21 July, 1549, the fifth Sunday after Trinity. By the way, we just read Trinity Collect. So I'm not excited about the 13th for some reason. I need to go back and look at it. But I, Trinity Collect will work every day here. So that's, it could be robust Trinitarians. <laughs> According to the ecclesiastical calendar, and in the midst of a year all, of almost unprecedented civil disorder, Archbishop Thomas Cranmer entered St. Paul's Cathedral. That'd be the one that burned down, of course, later in the London fire of, what, 1666-ish or so. Accompanied by the Lord Mayor and Alderman of London, 1549 is... Latimer fleeted up to the Bishop of London at this point. We've got work to do, as you can see. Uh, where's Thomas Beacon? Where's Stephen Gardner? He's float. Is he in the jail yet? Anyways, it got troubled out of Devonshire. Cranmer preached a sermon dissecting the causes of and proposed certain remedies for the civil disorder, which had gripped the realm since the promulgation of the new liturgy of the Book of Common Prayer. we got a footnote we'll go down to. The Privy Council had proclaimed martial law just three days previously in the face of open rebellion against the government in Norfolk, Oxfordshire, Buckinghamshire, and in the west parts of the country. The question we have right up front is, was there coordination? Pretty widespread, though, according to that right there. Well, footnote number one and two here to interrupt the, Dr. Kirby's narrative. The event is described by Sir Child, Charles Ryothesley, a chronicle of England during the reigns of the Tudors from 1485 to 1559. I got that over back in there somewhere. Read that last year. Uh, from a transcript made in the 17th century for the third Earl of Southampton. For, for another contemporary account, see Chronicle of Grey Friars of London by John Go Nichols, 25th XXJ, 21, 21st day of the same month, in which was Sunday. The Bishop of Canterbury came suddenly to Paul's. This is in the Old English. There should and made and sh there and there sh showed and made a narration of those that did rise in divers places within the realm and what rebellious they were and would take upon them to reform things before the law and to take the king's power in hand. The first Edwardine Book of Common Prayer was approved on 21 January 1549 with the passage by Parliament under King Edward VI, Act of Uniformity of Service and Administration of the Sacraments. Now, it's uh, we'll just interject here in this good, good article that 
it's my understanding that Tom Cranmer had in the month preceding that, December 14, 18, 1548, before this act is passed, gave uh, apparently a stunning advocate uh, statement, advocacy reflecting his reformed view of the Eucharistic presence. And that Bartholomew Treheron, as my understanding, heard it and wrote some of the Swiss, I don't have the deep footnote at hand, telling them that our tepid Cranmer <laughs> isn't so tepid, but he showed stunning, apparently it was a very stunning speech. Now that's the case. Um, I have a Charlie horse between the ears because his book 1549 which came out and caused this rebellion was sort of mocked by our friend from Winchester Steve Gardner as basically as Wiley Winchester is saying look I can read this as a Roman Catholic with transubstantiation and just be comfortable with it and that challenge stung Cranmer Plus the the cat Justice Jonas's catechism is out in that time frame, which has some unguarded Lutheranizing. Haven't settled that yet. Uh, Dermot McCulloch deals with that. Need to get back in that section. But if this be so, if Cranmer does this brilliant job in 1548, this again December in Parliament outlining his reform credentials on this subject, which would have been very like Vermigli, as I understand them. And we can only read the 1549 book with reformed eyes. That's just a hermeneutical tool, um, which some of the Anglo-Catholic and Tractarian crowd, uh, they love the 1549 because they think they can see real substantial corporeal presence in the book. I maintain that you can't do it that way. That you can only read the document according to the intention of the author. Now, Cranmer and Ridley in 1549 are reformed on the table, reflecting what will be the essence of the black rubric of the 1552. We'll have to make a subsequent historical decision on the 1559. But anyways, we're talk, we're interrupting here the narrative of the good prof. Uh, okay, footnote two for a succinct description of the 1549 rebellion. See Anthony Fletcher and Dermot McCulloch, the Tudor rebellions, especially page 52 to 1564 on the Western Rebellion. See also Francis Rose Troop, the Western Rebellion of 1549, an account of the insurrections in Devonshire and Cornwall against religious innovations in the reign of England, and Barrett Beer, Rebellion and Riot, Popular Disorder in England during the reign of Edward VI. Well, okay, we're talking about its widespread um, Back to the narrative. There had been various insurrections and disturbances in the West since the accession of Edward VI, notably in the response to the unpopularity of William Body, a lay archdeacon of Cornwall, formerly a close associate of Tom Cromwell, and now A protector Somers, uh, and now agent of Protector Somerset's policy of religious reform. The passage of the Act of Uniformity early in 1549 heralded a decisive turning point in the course of the English Reformation. It's got footnotes, we'll catch up with that. The Act required that after the Feast of Pentecost next coming, that is 9 June 1549, the offices and sacraments of the Church of England be conducted according to the new vernacular rites 
in replacement of the old Latin liturgies and in such order and form as is mentioned in the said book and none other otherwise. Now, it's kind of hard to know. You know, the monasteries, a lot of them have been shut down in 1535-ish, 36 to 39. Uh, we, we have questions about what was going on in the cathedrals and who were the hangers on and um, who was doing what, say, down in Exeter Cathedral or out in the far west, St. David's and Gloucester. I don't know. But... 1549 you gotta you got this is pretty radical to go from latin serum missile we're reading that in a separate series to now this more compressed book a single book in english with the english bible read just you know think of my my forebears were all farm folks as far as i understand and no nobility known to me I have all the nobility I want as an adopted son of God. Adoption in Pauline language, justification. <laughs> Let's not go down there. That's another subject. But farm people, you know, they're used to what they're used to. About, you know, and of course, the court, this is an intellectual reformation in, in London and Oxford and Cambridge. It's finally getting out to this, you know, where mom and dad and grandma and grandpa live. The act require okay, that the, okay, new vernacular rites and replacement of the old Latin liturgies, quote, in such order and form as mentioned in the said book and none other and otherwise. And of course, we're still wondering about the extent of lowerty at this time. The profound alteration of public worship was not widely popular, and it aroused resentment particularly in Cornwall and parts of Devon, where many of the people spoke little or no English. Enforcement of the new liturgy depended on the first Edwardine Act of Uniformity in 1549. Quote, all and singular ministers in any cathedral or parish church or other place within this realm of England, Wales, Calais, or Calais, and the marches of the same or other king's dominions shall from time after the feast of Pentecost next coming be bound to say and use the matins, even song, celebration of the Lord's Supper. Mass is a word that has bad associations, so Cranmer sent that off with the pigeons from the towers of the cathedrals. That in itself will be a disputed word. But there's some problems with that, which we'll get to a year, next year with Bishop Hooper and the vestment stuff. You know, and Ridley makes, who was it who made the claim? Was it Ridley? I forget who it was. Look, if you got associational problems with the vestments, you know, those popish rags. Well, the popes also have bell towers, and they use those, so we're going to get rid of bell towers. The papists also have pulpits. We're going to tear out pulpits. The papists had pews on the side, and they use those, rip those out. And you get the gist of the argument. Where do you draw this line? But that's that's up the road here. Um, everybody's going to use a shall from, be bound to say that commonly, com Lord's Supper commonly called the Mass. I think that disappears in 1552, an administration of each of the sacraments and all their common and open prayer in such order and form as is mentioned in the same book and none other or otherwise. And again, we get in our time machine and go back and go down to Exeter or some of these other places out west and think of how radical this was being imposed from above and all the past generations that had been baptized and married and buried and ordinations. What's this world coming to? That's probably what they were thinking. On Whit Sunday, 1549, the day following the authorized change in the liturgy, the parishioners 
of Sanford Courtney in Devon convinced the local priests to revert to the old ways, quote, we will not receive the new service because it is but like a Christmas game. Footnote seven. Justices arrived at the next service to enforce the change. An altercation at the service led to a proponent of the change, a William Hellion, being run through with a pitchfork on the church steps, gathering thousands of supporters, thousands. These religious traditionalists marched to Crediton and proceeded to lay siege to the city of Exeter to further their demands. Now it raises a question here. My forebears go, when my mother said, goes straight back. Uh, the Tonk and Kate went to Ontario, just near Toronto, in 1872 at age 40. He's from Exeter, 2,000 feet up the street from the cathedral. And the, the direct line is in Exeter back to 1555. So, you know, Exeter's been saged. And if you have, you can start, you see the walls, you can walk around up and down High Street, Win, uh, Exeter College, up a little north of the city there. That's where I had a wonderful discussion with the Bishop of Exeter there a couple of years back. Oh my. Because they kept cutting the front end off Evensong. And I didn't understand. I went to England to, you know, enjoy some of the services and Evensongs and everywhere I went, 21 cathedrals front part of the service flew off with the pigeon from the bell tower and I couldn't get any answers from anybody, including the professional musicians with a bunch of Anglican musicians. And finally, the presenter of Exeter Cathedral, I asked him an honest question because I didn't know. Went there expecting a 1662 service and he led me off the southern transept in Exeter Cathedral and we went through this room and that room was kind of fun in itself. And that good bishop, you know, the question was put to him by the presenter on my behalf. The bishop was unvesting or morning prayer or whatever. He was doing something. And his immediate word, you know, what happened in the front? He said, well, the Church of England is trying to get away from Cranmer's double predestination. Well, what do I know? My jaw dropped. I just sat and listened. And then he went on to talk about 20th century theology not liking the doctrine of original sin and sin. And so he said across the nation, there is this aversion in the cathedrals to the, that front part of the service. And he looked, it was a straight historical answer. He wasn't giving a value judgment one way or another. And it was, a, we, so we talked for about 30 minutes. It was a glorious discussion. Just a real rich experience. A real humble guy. I think he'd been dean at King's in Cambridge. It was a real pleasure, but that was kind of an eye opener. And um, I said, Did Grammar hold double? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, that brings us back to Vermigli and, and this volume that we're kind of reviewing again. So we're in Exeter, way down southwest, maybe, I don't know, a couple hundred miles from London. I'd have to check. Maybe about 8 o'clock as the crow would fly, 8 o'clock, 12 o'clock due north. So I suspect Exeter Cathedral is in compliance. It would be my guess. I forget who the bishop there was at the time. 1549. I know Miles Coverdale had been. But while economic oppression of the people by the gentry owing to the enclosure of the commons was of general and considerable concern, the formal demand of the rebels of Devon and Cornwall presented in a supplication to the king leave no doubt that the government's sweeping religious reforms played the primary role in fomenting the uprising. Now we have to interrupt the narrative of Dr. Kirby here. Um, footnote three, I, Arthurson, 
fear and loathing in West Cornwall, Cornwall, seven new letters of the 1548 rising journal of the Royal Institute of Cornwall. And Eamon Duffy stripping of the altars, page 463 to 67. To check that. For a full account of the Edwardian, Edwardian religious reform, see Dermot McCulloch's Tudor Church Militant. Uh, also, Dr. Bray's documents of the English Reformation. Seven, only three copies of the Western Rebels' demands are known to have survived. See the articles of us, U.S., us, the commoners of Devonshire, and Cornwall and divers camps of East and West of Exeter's in a rare cop track copy, a copy of the letter in Rose Troop, Western Rebellion. Number eight, and then it's a reference to this letter. So, um, well, we got down here to whatever page we're at. In direct opposition to the newly Imposed religious settlement. We'll have to end it here and pick it up on the next session. It kind of gives us a vivid feel for how serious this was. We haven't got the Cranmer yet. Hymn 95. While shepherds watch their flocks by night, all seated on the ground, the angel of the Lord came down and glory shone round. Paging Rudolf Boltman. Do you like that hymn, Rudolf? <laughs> Thank goodness. He's, whatever. That's another story. Rudolf Boltman. Um, let's pray. Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ our Savior, through the Holy Spirit our Comforter, be and abide with us now and evermore. Amen. Godspeed. Thank goodness for Dr. Kirby. <laughs> Oh, you got to love scholars. They're, they're the bishops to this old guy. He's, listen, you get the hearing aids in and pay close attention because, man, they, oh, man, we're just food and drink. God bless.